And today I'm going to tell you about some of the work that um, I've been doing with my colleague Lou Kondich, who's here in the audience, and our ex-PhD student Michael Lamb on um, the modeling and large-scale simulations of uh, thin film liquid crystal flows. So um, here's the brief uh, overview. Um, I'll um, introduce pneumatic liquid crystals um, really in the context of the experimental systems that we've been looking at. Um, so these are experiments carried out by other groups. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of the way that we model these systems. Um, and particularly important for our modeling is going to be um, the effects of uh, surface anchoring. I'll say more about that as we go along. Um, and then I will uh, show you some of the large-scale simulations that we've done on these experimental systems. Uh, and those have been implemented on a GPU. And that's really uh, Michael Lamb's work. So it's been known for a long time that um, thin films of pneumatic liquid crystals um, can exhibit uh, rather interesting behavior on many different scales, uh, different length scales and different time scales. Um, so here's really just um, sort of a, 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 a selection of experimental results. Um, most of these are from about 20 years ago, um, a little bit less in some cases. Um, and they're due to various different groups. So uh, these images that you see at the top left and the top right, uh, they're from Poulard and Kazabat's paper in 2005. Um, I think uh, this image here uh, may be from the Schlagowski paper. Um, Herminghaus and co-workers, I think, is this image here. And then these are images from Van Effenter and co-workers. And in all cases, uh, what you're seeing is a thin film or droplet of pneumatic liquid crystal uh, viewed from above. So you're looking down um, onto a film or droplet. Uh, in these two cases here, you can clearly see the edge of a spreading droplet. In the other cases, um, you're looking at what was initially a uniform film. And uh, that film has stabilized and uh, de-wetted in several cases. Um, and we're particularly interested in um, very thin films, so uh, th films where the thickness is the order of uh, tens of nanometers. Um, so that's, uh, these experimental images here uh, are in such a situation. So um, in, as I said, in both of these cases, what you're looking at is uh, a film of liquid crystal. It's being viewed from above. Um, and to get an idea of the thicknesses, uh, you can look at this image in the middle. Uh, the scale here is in microns, um, so the maximum film thickness is about 0.05 or 0.04 microns, so tens of nanometers. Um, and what you'll see in this image here is, um, well, you, have, uh, you clearly have an undulation type of instability uh, that you see um, in, the, in these regions here, but you also have these larger de-wetted patches. And in some cases, the, those de-wetted patches have what uh, looks to be kind of a satellite droplet in the middle. So in uh, this image on the left, the dark areas are thicker parts of the film, the lighter areas are thinner parts of the film. And um, here, you're just looking at a snapshot across uh, one portion of the film. So uh, this part here corresponds to the shorter scale undulations and here you're looking at one of those uh, larger de-wetted patches. And in the image on the right, uh, you see only the shorter scale undulations. You don't see any of those larger scale uh, de-wetted patches. Um, so what we'll propose, um, what our work proposes, is that such de-wetting behavior can be described by um, a thin film model. Uh, so, so for those of you who um, do fluid mechanics, uh, you're probably familiar with the, uh, these thin film type models, uh, but I'll try and give you a flavor of the modeling and give you come more from the liquid crystal side of things. Um, and one thing that's important um, is that you need, you need an appropriate, what we call a structural disjoining pressure in this thin film model. And uh, we're also going to look um, later on in the talk at the effects of variable substrate anchoring, and I'll say um, how we model that as we go along. Um, so I probably don't need to uh, say that to this audience, but um, you know, liquid crystals are orientationally ordered soft matter, so substances with um, orientational but no um, positional order. And pneumatic liquid crystals, which is what we're looking at, are typically composed of long rod-like molecules, and 
and because they're electrostatic molecules, uh, polar molecules, uh, they interact with their neighbors and they like to align with their neighbors in particular. So although they flow like fluids, they also have this elastic character. And you'll typically see uh, diagrams like this used to, um, to represent them. So uh, you have crystals here, which are, um, you, you know, they have very uh, rigid orientational and, um, and positional order. Liquids have neither, and these liquid crystals are somewhere in between. Um, and so because, because you've got these little rod-like molecules that like to align, um, then the viscosity of the fluid uh, depends on the molecular orientation relative to the flow direction. And so when you're modeling these things, uh, as well as thinking about the velocity field and how they're flowing, um, so velocity field we'll call V as a function of space and time, uh, you need also to think about what those molecules are doing, what's their local um, average direction, and um, that is typically represented by um, the director field. Um, and we'll be, we'll be using the Leslie Erickson formulation, so uh, we really just have to think about N as being a unit vector for the purposes of our modeling. And um, so for a unit vector, we can really just represent it in terms of two angles, uh, theta and phi, and those are the usual polar angles. So um, theta is going to be the angle made by the vertical axis, so uh, what you might think of as the polar angle, while phi is the uh, azimuthal uh, angle going round and round. And um, thinking about these as fluids, well, the stress tensor is then going to be a function of the director field, uh, as also is the internal elastic energy density, uh, which we denote by W of the pneumatic liquid crystal. Um, so as I said, we're using the Leslie Erickson formulation, which is pretty much the very simplest formulation you can use for a pneumatic liquid crystal. Um, and the stress tensor uh, takes the form given here. So you have an isotropic component, which uh, depends on the fluid pressure and the elastic energy W. Because we're thinking about these uh, very, very thin films, we're also going to include um, a disjoining of Van der Waals pressure contribution. Um, so I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, and then you also have this um, anisotropic part, the uh, viscous part of the stress tensor, and that's characterized by six viscosities. Um, and the full expression is given here, so um, you have these uh, six different viscosities. Uh, you have this capital M, which depends on how molecules are rotating. You have a symmetric rate of strain tensor. You have an anti-symmetric rate of strain tensor, and the whole expression is really rather complicated, uh, so we, we would like to simplify it. Um, and um, so just to say a little bit more about the form of the elastic energy that we use. So, um, you know, we've already said that these molecules like to align uh, with neighbors. Distortions are penalized. Uh, so we use the usual uh, Frank elastic energy, where you have a splay contribution, a twist contribution, and a bend contribution. Um, so it's a positive, definite um, quadratic form. It's clearly minimized when uh, the liquid crystal, when the director field is distortion-free. So uh, the minimum, minimum energy state would be that the director field is just uniform everywhere with all the molecules aligned. Um, and it's, you know, it's long been known that this uh, elastic energy simplifies if those three elastic constants are equal, uh, which is not true in practice, but it's uh, usually a good enough approximation. So um, that's an approximation that we also make us uh, the single elastic constant. So we'll be setting all of our um, splay, twist, and bend constants to be equal to a single elastic constant K. And uh, we're going to ignore the subtle splay contribution uh, for, for the purposes of our modeling. Um, it's thought to be uh, not very important. So as I said, we're, um, we're going to be using the Leslie Erickson model. And we also make a number of uh, simplifying or critical modeling assumptions that help us come up with a, a tractable model for how this free surface of the film evolves. Um, so the first important assumption we make is, um, you know, we're considering thin films spreading on horizontal substrates. And um, in all of those experimental images that I showed you, the aspect ratio of interest, uh, which you can think of as being a typical film height, uh, relative to a length scale of interest, the length scale of those undulations, um, that aspect ratio is very small. So uh, that means we can use uh, standard long wave scalings to non-dimensionalize the problem. So we'll scale our lateral lengths with L and the um, perpendicular lengths with H. 
um, and that will enable us to identify uh, dominant gradients in the governing equations. Um, these films are flowing very slowly, um, so we'll be looking in the case where inertia is certainly negligible. Uh, for those who think about fluids, that's uh, a small reduced Reynolds number case. And here you'll see I've... Um, so here we've got uh, rho is the density of the fluid, u is a typical lateral velocity scale, l is a typical lateral length scale, um, and you'll see I've used mu here, that's uh, just a typical uh, viscosity in the problem. We actually set mu to be uh, alpha 4 uh, in, in our problem. Um, so, as we said, the tendency of these rod-like uh, molecules to align with each other um, we're assuming is characterized by a single elastic constant, K. Um, and we're going to assume that um, this its a, essentially a scaled inverse Erickson number, uh, but really it characterizes the relative effects of viscosity to elasticity on the problem. We'll be assuming that is very small. And what that means from a physical perspective is that the time scale of the elastic response of the molecules to any free surface deformations um, well, the time scale of the elastic response uh, is much faster than that on which the fluid flow happens. Um, so what that means is that if we know the instantaneous shape of the free surface, we can just um, essentially quasi-statically minimize the free energy. So we're always solving a static problem for the, as far as the um, elastic energy is concerned. And what's nice about that is it means we can essentially solve for the direct orientation uh, given an instantaneous film geometry. Um, so, we need to think about um, what's going on at the interfaces. I mean, obviously, if you have an unbounded domain of liquid crystal, then uh, the molecules would just align. So, what's making them not all align with each other in our problem? Uh, well, that's surface effects. So, um, here's just a schematic of, of what we have. So, we have some uh, planar substrate, uh, silicon in the experiments, and we have the, this... Um, undulatory film overlying it. So we've got a free surface and we've got a solid substrate. Um, well, what assumptions are we going to make on the anchoring at those interfaces? On the solid substrate, I'm going to assume a strong planar anchoring. So that angle theta that I introduced earlier is always going to be pi by 2. And because we want our model to allow also for um, directional substrate anchoring, I'm actually going to assume that we can uh, impose the direct angle phi on the substrate, so we can look at the effects of uh, directional anchoring there. Um, so these are very simple because those are just um, Dirichlet boundary conditions that we can impose. Um, at the free surface, um, we're actually going to use a weak anchoring model. So as far as the direct angle phi, which is the azimuthal angle, is concerned, um, I'm going to assume uh, conical anchoring, uh, which is just a natural boundary condition, d phi by dz is zero. Um, and for the angle theta, uh, we'll be assuming weak homeotropic or perpendicular surface anchoring. Um, so that means that as well as the bulk elastic energy that I wrote down earlier, uh, we also need to consider a surface contribution. Uh, well, what form does that surface contribution take? Um, well, I'm giving you heuristically rather than, uh, rather than in great detail because it, it's a little bit messy, but... Um, so the schematic of what's going on is here. So if I was to, to assume um, strong perpendicular anchoring at the surface, then you'd have to have this picture of what's going on on the left here, where no matter how thin the film is, uh, the molecules are always forced to rotate through uh, an angle pi by 2. And obviously, for very thin films, that would give you a huge energy penalty. Um, so that's not a realistic situation. So the picture we have in mind is what you see on the right here, where as the film um, gets thinner and thinner, that surface anchoring can, can relax. Um, but once the film is sufficiently thin, then um, so it's sufficiently thick, which is that high state there, uh, then you have something that's more approaching the, um, the homeotropic anchoring state. So um, with an appropriate form of surface energy, so you could use Rapini Papula, you could use... Um, you could use any uh, equivalent model that, um, that phenomenologically does the same thing. Uh, but the outcome is always the same, that uh, when you substitute the scalings into your elastic energy bulk plus surface contribution, and you do the minimization, uh, what comes out is not surprisingly 
that uh, the direct angle theta has to be a linear function of z. Um, on z equals 0, we've insisted on the strong planar anchoring. So z equals 0, theta is always pi by 2, as you can see from this expression here. <coughs> And on z equals h, um, well, the orientation is going to depend on the film thickness, as this schematic here indicates. Uh, how does it depend on the film thickness? Well, um, we have some horrible nonlinear function m of h, which is what contains all of that surface uh, anchoring uh, model in it. Uh, but it, it always has the same characteristics. For thick films, that function is going to look like 1 which means that uh, the angle theta would always be zero uh, for sufficiently thick films. But as the film gets... Th oh, sorry. Hopefully it's not going to sleep. Uh, there we go. Uh, but as the film gets thinner and thinner, this function uh, is approaching zero, which is this uh, relaxed anchoring state that you see there. So um, all of the surface anchoring is, is really embedded in this function m of h, uh, but it always looks like this here. And we have some um, dimensionless parameter beta, which is really a dimensionless length scale. Um, so you can think of beta as saying that for films much thicker than beta, surface anchoring is effectively strong and homeotropic. But when the film thickness is much smaller than beta, uh, surface anchoring is very weak. So all of our um, surface energy is embedded in that uh, function m. OK, so uh, that's how we deal with the energetics. But we still need to think about how this film is moving, which means we need to think about the momentum equations. And the momentum equations are really just these uh, quasi-static um, divergence of the stress tensor is 0. Um, and the strategy for these things is always the same. Uh, for those who come from a fluid dynamics background, again, this should be very familiar. But um, I'll go through the basic idea. Um, so we have this uh, thin film aspect ratio. We know that um, thicknesses are perpendicular to the film are much smaller than uh, lateral length scales of interest. Um, so that means that we can, uh, you know, once we've introduced the appropriate long wave scalings, we're able to identify um, leading order terms in these momentum equations. And if you don't do that, uh, it's extremely messy, but uh, you can get a much simpler system by taking this approach. Uh, the vertical component, or the component uh, perpendicular to the film, if you like, uh, that typically yields an expression for the pressure at leading order, while the lateral components um, give you equations, they're not usually very nice equations, but equations for the lateral velocity components u and v of the liquid crystal film. Um, very simple considerations of flux uh, tell you that the film height has to satisfy uh, a continuity equation of this type here. So um, dh by dt, how the film is moving up and down, is related to the divergence of the lateral fluid flux. Um, so here, uh, the fluid flux is defined in the obvious way. It's just the integral of uh, the lateral velocity components across the thickness of the film. Um, well, in principle, we know uh, what, these ex what these velocity components u and v are from the uh, leading order la lateral components of our momentum equations. So we're able to um, evaluate this integral expression here and um, ultimately arrive at a, a fourth order nonlinear partial differential equation for the film height. And the reason it's fourth order is because um, it con contains fourth order spatial derivatives uh, due to this term here. It's first order in time, fourth order in space. And that's what this equation looks like. Um, it's this equation at the top here. And uh, if you are familiar with fluid dynamical problems, then um, you know, the general form of this equation will look quite familiar to you. But it has uh, a number of additional terms in there, which uh, arise from the pneumatic nature of the, uh, of the fluid we're considering. Um, but essentially, these terms here uh, capture surface tension effects in the film. So this. Uh, Calligraphic C is um, an inverse capillary number. So um, again, you're seeing the aspect ratio of the film um, here. Gamma is the surface tension. Mu is the viscosity. U is a typical lateral um, velocity. Um, and this term here captures, um, well, both the um, van der Waals contributions, uh, which we need because the film is so thin that we need to account for uh, intermolecular um, interactions between uh, molecules in the film and uh, the substrate also. Uh, but really, the pneumatic character of the film uh, appears in this term here. So um, this curly n is um, a dimensionless inverse Erickson number. 
And you'll see again this function m of h, which uh, captures the surface anchoring effects. So I'm just reminding you what it, uh, what it looks like there. Um, so this is the uh, governing equation that we have to solve. And uh, you'll also notice that um, in addition to uh, standard gradient operators, we also have this uh, grad tilde. Um, and that is what captures the effect of uh, any variability in substrate anchoring. So um, here, this is just the identity tensor. So if that parameter nu was 0, uh, grad tilde would just be um, you know, you know, a standard uh, gradient operator. But, um, but whenever this parameter nu, which is related to the uh, liquid crystal viscosities, whenever that parameter nu is positive, then um, any, any kind of um, non-trivial substrate anchoring, any directionality in the substrate anchoring would make itself felt um, through these terms here. Um, and as I said, we're going to be considering um, this angle phi to be specified. Okay, whatever it is on the substrate, it has to be throughout the bulk of the film. That arises from the energy minimization. So we would expect that as this parameter nu increases, then you'd see the effect of uh, variations in planar substrate anchoring to increase in any simulations. Um, so that uh, effective disjoining pressure that I showed you here, or structural disjoining pressure, that accounts for both uh, van der Waals forces and the pneumatic character of the film, um, this is what it looks like as um, a function of film thickness. And um, you know, in order to get a sense of what these equations were doing, we first carried out a large number of uh, simulations on uh, two-dimensional films, by which I mean um, h is a function of x and t only. And there, roughly speaking, you find that uh, films below a certain um, thickness are linearly stable. <clears throat> but this is really below the precursor thickness, I guess. Um, there's a range of film heights where you would see um, de-wetting de of your film. Films that are sufficiently thick, you would see that they're linearly stable. And within this uh, linearly unstable regime, uh, the type of behavior you see uh, depends on whether this effective disjoining pressure is actually uh, positive or negative. Uh, if it's negative, you tend to see primary droplets only when, when the thing de-wets. Um, and here you'd see primary and secondary droplets only. Um, that's the very simple picture. In fact, it's uh, more complicated than that. Even in two space dimensions, um, when, we, you know, when we did a large suite of simulations, we were actually able to identify eight different regimes, uh, which I'll very quickly summarize for you here. Uh, I already said we have linearly unstable regimes, which means the film uh, will de-wet. We have linearly stable regimes. Within the linearly unstable regime, we either have de-wetting with primary drops only or de-wetting where you get primary and smaller secondary droplets. We have a region where the film is absolutely stable. No matter how much you perturb it, you're not going to see de-wetting. Uh, but we have a metastable regime, which means the film is um, linearly stable, but it's unstable if you perturb it uh, sufficiently, um, sufficiently strongly. Um, we have a spinodal regime um, within which either random or local perturbations will cause the film to de-wet, but the mean drop, drop spacing will always be as predicted by a linear stability analysis. Um, and we have a nucleation regime uh, within which localized perturbations, so if I just sort of perturb my film at a single point or at um, multiple isolated single points, uh, localized perturbations would, would induce de-wetting um, but the uh, drop spacing or the size of the de-wetted patches would not be well predicted by linear stability. Uh, and in those cases, you can make some analytical progress by using the so-called uh, marginal stability criterion. But really what I want to show you is um, some of our three-dimensional simulations. And behavior can um, obviously be even more complicated um, when you allow the film to be function of uh, both x and y and time, the film height. Um, so first of all, we, uh, we were using uh, a code written on a CPU to solve these equations. And so this is um, just one example of um, our CPU co code simulations. Um, so you know, we were, were able to get things that um, at least qualitatively looked some, somewhat like we see in the experiments. But um, essentially, given, the, uh, given how long the code took to run, uh, the complexity of the governing equations, um, it was really going to be uh, 
too time consuming to run this code to long times and to large domains comparable to those in the experiments. Um, so we wanted to uh, do better than that. Um, and in order to obtain long time simulations for um, experimentally relevant uh, domain sizes, um, Michael Lamb, who um, was our student at the time, he actually developed um, from scratch a new um, code that to, to run on a GPU. So um, he called it Gadit. It's uh, freely available on GitHub. And it was Gadit because it's GPU alternating direction implicit thin film solver. Um, so it's actually much more general than the equation that we use it to solve. Um, alternating direction implicit, or ADI, is just the uh, numerical method that's used to solve the governing equation. Uh, it's fully implicit. It's, um, he developed it, uh, well, it's, it's written in uh, C++. Um, he developed it using uh, NVIDIA's CUDA architecture. Uh, but importantly, for our purposes, it reliably gives upwards of uh, 30 times speed up on simulations for the slowest bottleneck parts of the code uh, compared with uh, CPU. And um, also, for those of you who work in thin films, it's easily adapted to other thin film problems. So I do encourage you to look at it. Um, as I said, it's freely available on GitHub. Uh, there's just a snapshot from the page uh, where you will find it. Um, so let me just show you some of the simulations. And first of all, the simulations that I will show you all have that parameter um, new, which um, measures any substrate directionality in the anchoring. Uh, the first few simulations will all have that parameter set to zero, which means we're looking at degenerate planar substrate anchoring. So here what we're going to simulate is, um, well, these are just experimental values that we put in to, uh, to get the, the, the right numbers in our film. So a uh, 50 nanometer thick uh, pneumatic liquid crystal film, um, I believe it's the parameters for 5CB that are used here. Um, and here, we've taken a film that was initially flat, except we put on uh, a random, uh, very small amplitude perturbation. Uh, the numerical domain size is as shown here. Physically, it's um, roughly two uh, millimeters square. And let me just show you what happens. So you'll see we're in the unstable regime, so the film uh, rapidly starts to de-wet. Ultimately, the final state has to be uh, droplets. Um, but you'll see we're in that regime where we get um, larger droplets. This would be um, fairly well predicted by linear stability, but we also have these smaller uh, satellite droplets here as well. And just to show you, um, uh, oh, I didn't mean to uh, repeat it. I'm trying to show you how it compares with uh, There we go. Um, so what you see on the left here is uh, a snapshot from that simulation I just showed you. And here on the right are two different uh, experimental images. Um, so we didn't quite use the, uh, I think the closest approximation is the parameters we chose are closest to this experiment here. Uh, but certainly qualitatively, um, the agreement looks to be uh, very good, we believe. Um, so here's another simulation. Again, there's no directionality in the substrate anchoring. Um, but um, in addition to putting randomized perturbations on the film, we also um, add a number of localized perturbations because we want to try and simulate some of those larger de-wetted patches that you saw in the experiment. Um, and indeed, you'll see that those uh, localized perturbations make themselves felt first. <coughs> So the localized perturbations start to de-wet first, and then later on in the simulation, you'll see the effects of those random perturbations. They're starting to uh, appear now. But again, at very long times, uh, the final state has to be um, droplets, uh, total breakup of the film. But you still see these larger patches where those uh, initial um, localized perturbations were. And again, if you take uh, an appropriate snapshot from uh, during that simulation and you compare it to the experimental results, um, it's quite good qualitative uh, agreement with the experimental uh, results. 
So um, I also wanted to show you uh, a few simulations where we look at um, cases where we have directional substrate anchoring. So if I allow that parameter new uh, to be positive in our model, then these terms would become important, and we have to worry about what kind of um, anchoring pattern we're imposing on the substrate. And we can ask, how does that uh, influence the evolution of the film? Well, the simplest uh, way analytically to see what that might do is um, to carry out linear, linear stability analysis for um, a certain fixed direction of substrate anchoring. So if I set this angle phi to be zero, then that means my substrate anchoring is always parallel to the x-axis. So all the molecules um, are forced to lie parallel to the x-axis on the substrate. Um, and then I look at what happens to two different perturbations. So I can either put a perturbation on um, where ridges are perpendicular to the x-axis or where they're parallel to the x-axis. And you can do linear stability analysis of uh, small perturbations to a flat film, ask what happens to each of those um, perturbations, and you find that generally the same, um, the same rule will appear for whether or not those perturbations are stable or unstable. It depends on all the things in your model, as you would expect. But importantly, uh, there's a scaling factor that emerges that depends on this parameter nu. And um, so we see that in one case, that scaling factor is a half plus two nu. In the other case, it's just a half. Oh, well, what that means from the point of view of our model is that when we're in the unstable regime where per perturbations are growing, uh, these perturbations that are perpendicular to the anchoring direction will grow faster in this case where substrate um, anchoring directionality is important. So just to uh, illustrate that, here what I'm showing you is simulations for that case where nu is zero. So um, uh, in these pictures, the x, x direction is along here, the y direction is along here. Again, we're looking down on a film from above. Um, and uh, you're seeing six uh, different snapshots from six different simulations. Here, the parameter nu is zero. Here, it's a quarter. And uh, at intermediate cases, it's just increasing uh, from zero to a quarter. And of course, here you will see that the uh, de-wetting occurs in a pretty homogeneous way. Uh, there's no directionality apparent in there. But here you will very clearly see the effect that those, um, these perturbations are growing faster than ones that are parallel to the x direction. And if I show you a snapshot at a later time, uh, that's even more evident. Uh, here the uh, substrate anchoring directionality is very strongly seen. If you wait long enough, of course, you get break up into uh, droplets at final times. Uh, but even so, in this case, here you'll see that these droplets are um, kind of aligned along tracks, so that even at late times, you see the influence of that, um, of that substrate directionality. Um, so one of the things um, in the early days when we were speaking to uh, people who'd done the experiments, one of the things that they thought might affect um, their results was whether or not defects are present. Now, of course, we can't um, truly simulate defects within the limitations of our model because we're only doing um, Leslie Erickson. But um, one very simple way to see how it might influence the, um, you know, the evolution of, the, of an overlying film is um, you know, within our model, we can simply impose any substrate anchoring pattern and see what happens to the overlying film. So that's what we did in a few simple cases. So here, uh, we've simply imposed um, kind of a, a minus one defect pattern on our substrate. And um, we can see what happens to an overlying film when you insist that substrate anchoring takes that form there. Um, don't worry too much about what's going on, on the right. That's just um, the Fourier modes that you're seeing are uh, evolving. But this is what shows the uh, evolution of the overlying film, so you can see. Uh, that indeed, uh, in accordance with our predictions, uh, it's really the, you know, we started with just a, a random perturbation to the free surface, but it's always the perturbations that are perpendicular to the local anchoring direction that are seen first. So you always see this um, kind of mirror, mirroring of whatever the um, substrate anchoring is doing. So here's... Um, a plus one anchoring pattern, and I'm sure you could predict, given the last one, what's going to happen here. You would expect to see sort of concert concentric uh, circles start to develop in the, um, in the free surface over a pattern like this, and indeed, uh, that's what we see. And obviously, if you wait um, 
long enough, you will get final time breakup into droplets, but um, you'll always see some sort of um, footprint of the uh, initial anchoring pattern that was, that was imposed. Oh dear, sorry about that. For some reason, too many movies seems to... Um... Ay, ay, ay. Um, do I want to restore? Oh, what happened there? Sorry about this. Nope. How do I get rid of this? My escape key isn't doing anything. Um. Yeah, I tried that. Doesn't Great. do anything. <laughs> Just let me unplug it for a second. And, and then I can... Uh, uh, right. Let's see if this works. There we go. Um... Okay, maybe I won't risk another movie, but um, here's just a still from um, another superimposed substrate uh, anchoring pattern. Um, that would be a plus one half defect. Um, and you can also string together, I mean, we're just imposing this substrate anchoring, so you can pretty much impose any um, substrate anchoring pattern you like uh, and look at the evolution of the overlying film. Um, Uh, I won't risk this, but you can do um, a nice continuously varying substrate anchoring pattern um, and look at the evolution of the film overlying that. Um, so I'll just uh, skip to the conclusions, I guess, and um, say that... Um, so essentially, you, you know, we can, um, we can simulate uh, de-wetting of films uh, with arbitrary substrate anchoring, uh, we can have degenerate planar anchoring, we can have directional substrate anchoring. Um, and certainly in many of the simulations that I've shown you, um, you know, we're talking about films that are tens of nanometers, so any pneumatic bending across the film is likely to be very minimal. Um, but even in cases like that, uh, you get non-trivial evolution that differs from that that you would see uh, with a Newtonian fluid. Um, and certainly in cases where we can impose directionality of the substrate anchoring, then the um, de-wetting patterns, um, the free surface devolution, uh, is really very different indeed to what you would see in other situations here. Um, we haven't yet seen any experiments of um, where people have looked at imposing substrate anchoring directionality and uh, seen how that affects film de-wetting. Uh, we'd be very interested to see um, experiments of that kind here. The closest things I've seen have been uh, in an art gallery, so um, those are the, uh, the closest to an experimental image to, uh, to indicate substrate directionality uh, that I have. Um, we have, you know, thanks to our student Michael Lamb, he's now working at a national laboratory in Mississippi. It's the Coastal Hydro Hydraulics Laboratory. Um, Thanks to his excellent computational skills, we now have uh, a very nice and freely available GPU-based numerical method. Um, what's nice about that is it allows us to simulate uh, large domains uh, comparable to those that you see in an experiment and to very large times, so all the way up to uh, final de-wetting into uh, droplets. And, uh, of course, what that allows us to do is to compare to our available experimental data. Um, and that numerical method, as I said, is uh, widely adaptable to uh, many other thin film type problems. So uh, I'll just finish with my acknowledgements. Uh, National Science Foundation for funding um, 
my collaborators, Lou Kondich and Michael Lamb. I didn't actually get to talk about Ancela's work uh, today, but she's working on um, kind of the next phase of this project on dielectro wetting. Um, and those are the credits for the experimental images. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Uh, did you try uh, also to simulate without um, intermolecular potential, but rather with a sleep condition? Without what, sorry? Um, so did you try to simulate your model without potential, uh, without intermolecular potential, Leonard Jones potential, but with uh, sleep condition, uh, like Navier sleep? Or? No, no, we didn't. Um, so you mean with a, with a contact line? It's a contact of, line, yeah. No, no, we haven't done any uh, problems with, with an actual contact line. Uh, be, yeah, the, the Van der Waals model that we use um, precludes the need to do that. But do you think it's no problem, as in classical implementation? Um, it shouldn't be. I mean, it's an alternative way to deal with um, contact lines. But we think it's probably, uh, for, for, certainly for the experiments that we were looking at, uh, we think the, um, the Van der Waals model is the appropriate one because, you know, the, the films seem, do seem to have uh, very thin precursor-type regions. Yeah, in this experiment, yes, if you model droplets, but if you just model kind of spreading, uh, mm -hmm. would you take the sleep condition or in this case? Or? Well, you could. Was you going to say something? Like yeah, no, not at all. So there's, there's a technical issue here. So we are solving a, a PDE, uh, and uh, that PDE is degenerate. So as soon as your solution hits zero, uh, you're done. So you must, even if you have a sleep model, you still have to put in something what people sometimes call numerical precursor, uh, which is essentially a numerical trick which prevents your solution from hitting zero. And then you end up with a combination of uh, both sleep and a numerical precursor film, and uh, for my taste at least, it's a little bit too many length scales on a, on a very short. It makes, it makes it complicated. It's doable, but it's, uh, it's, it's a bit messy. That's my view. Thank you for the nice talk. So I was just wondering if you could emphasize a little bit on the role of the S parameter, of the de scalar degree of water in this, in such the wetting uh, phenomenon. Right? Because you looked pr at, at the, this primarily from the director level, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, and my, my question is, you know, do, you, do you expect that S parameter, so scalar degree of water is relevant in such, such systems? I realize there's surface which imposes its own degree of water. So I was just wondering about your thoughts on that. Um. Can you, can you um, elaborate a little bit more on what you... So my question like is, so if, it, if you were to use Q-tensor Q theory, right, yeah. would you expect to see something different? Or if you would use the scalar order parameter equations incorporated into that, would you expect something different? Um, I would hope not radically different. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, Georgie was saying uh, that he and collaborators are working on uh, a version of this problem with a Q-tensor included, is that right? But you haven't yet simulated it. <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would hope that it wouldn't be radically different, of course, because... <laughs> Any other questions? Can one do some simple analytical wavelength selection to get the droplet size? Yes. Yeah, you can do, uh, if you do a linear stability uh, analysis of the flat film, then you do get a prediction of uh, the droplet size. And in most cases, that gives you uh, a, a certainly a very good uh, estimate of the droplet size. But there are a few regimes, um, in particular those large de-wetted patches, for example, where, um, where those predictions break down. But you can do something uh, related to the so-called marginal stability criterion in cases like that. And is that dependent on the on the degree of order in a liquid crystal? Um, I don't think so. Maybe not no. so much. Yeah. At least not within the not within the limitations right. of our model. 
Yeah. Very good.